authorities have bombed any and all attempts to hunt down the indicted Balkan war criminal Ratko Mladic. Last week, the world's media reported that Mladic was about to be handed over to the International War Crimes Tribunal in The Hague. The deadline, in fact, was supposed to be yesterday. But as we go to air, Mladic has yet to be cited, with the press now reporting that the next deadline for his handover by Serbia is early April. Yet another intriguing chapter in this long-running international saga that, if it wasn't so serious, would be laughable. This was it. Pull up, pull up. General Ratko Mladic is probably the world's most wanted indicted war criminal. Dateline's producer cameraman David Brill filmed these exclusive scenes back in June 1992 at the height of the Balkans war. For Bosnian Serbs, Mladic wasn't seen as the great villain of his age. More of a father figure protecting them in the battle against the Croats, Bosnian Muslims and the breakup of the old Yugoslavia. What happened to this little boy here? On a radio, there's no explosive, sorry, with the Nepretiske granate. As you can see, od napada Ustaški snaga nisu poštedjena ni šestogodišnja djeca. Mladic was idolised and feared in equal measure. Not long after this film was shot, the Serb general's Bosnian forces carried out the Srebrenica massacre. As many as 8,000 Muslim men and boys held in what was supposed to be a UN safe haven were ruthlessly executed. Mladic, accused of organising that 1995 massacre, was later indicted by the UN War Crimes Tribunal on charges of genocide. Rat je krenuo sa hrvatsko muslimanske strane i on je nametnut Srbima. Srbi od prvoga dana vode odbranbeni rat i brane svoje ognjišta, brane svoje živote i svoju decu, kao što vidite ono šestogodišnje dijete tamo ranjeno u krevetu. U ratu sam izgubio mnogo prijatelja i mnogo bliske rodbine. Jedina uteha što su pali u borbi za pravednu stvar. Along with the Bosnian Serb leader Radovan Karadic, who's also still on the run, he became a symbol of the brutality of that period in the Balkans. After the conflict ended, Mladic lived life relatively openly, despite his indictment as a war criminal. Until five years ago, he'd been protected by Yugoslav President Slobodan Milosevic and was reportedly seen at football matches and eating out. But after Milosevic's arrest, Mladic went underground, supported, it said, by factions within the Serbian army. <laughs> Despite numerous NATO-led raids to hunt him down, he remains free. To many Serbian nationalists, a favourite son, a national hero. But of late, the tide's been turning against Mladic. Europe has given Serbia an ultimatum. Hand him over for trial, or forget about ever joining the EU and the benefits that would flow from that. The US, on the other hand, has reportedly offered money. Five million US dollars to his family and bodyguards if he turns himself in. At the end of last week, rumours had Mladic in negotiations with the Serb government or that he had been arrested. But so far, there's still no sign of the elusive indicted war criminal. I hope this time we will do that in spite i must tell you i do not know where general mladic is john lakare has to make up scenarios like that so what's the mladic caper all about a short while ago i spoke via satellite from johannesburg with judge richard goldstone judge goldstone was the chief prosecutor for the international criminal tribunal in the hague had actually drew up the indictment against Mladic. And from London, Marcus Tanner, 
a correspondent with the Independent newspaper, who's covered Balkan politics for years. Gentlemen, uh, thanks very much for your time. Uh, Judge Goldstone, when you indicted uh, Ratko Maladic in 1995, did you imagine that 10 years later he would still be on the loose? No, absolutely not. I assumed completely in 1995 that the NATO forces would very promptly arrest Maladic and Karadic, who was jointly indicted with him. I was quite surprised, indeed shocked, uh, at the lack of political will at that time to pick them up, and certainly it could have been done. You say it was a lack of political will. What, what do you mean? I mean, the suggestion now is that he's being protected, and in fact uh, your successor has suggested that the Serbian authorities are indeed protecting him. And that's the reason for the delay. Is that what you mean by lack of political will or what? Right, well, I well by lack of political will, certainly in 1995, what I, was, uh, what I was talking about was that the major NATO powers, and particularly the United States, uh, but also supported by the major European powers, were simply not prepared to take the risk of retaliation and hostage taking that they feared would follow in the wake of an arrest. Do you think that was the reason or was another one? No, no, I think that was the reason. There was no, I don't think there was any political reason. I think the United States and the European powers, uh, and certainly the United States, would have been very happy to have him on trial at The Hague, but they weren't prepared to put their soldiers at risk. Um, Marcus, uh, what do you think? Do you agree with uh, Judge Goldstone? Why do you think he has not been picked up? Why do you think he hasn't handed himself over? Uh, well, I'd very much agree with the judge, really, that um, there was no will in the, among the NATO powers in, in Bosnia, and there was still this feeling that um, the outside world had to somehow mollify and I think mollycoddle Serbia a little bit, and I think that feeling has, uh, persists to this, to this day, actually. Perhaps you're, the Europeans are getting a bit tougher now, but it's taken a long time, I think, for people to apply the same tough standards to Serbia that they've applied to some other powers in the region. Yeah, but, but Judge, this man, the crimes that he has been alleged to have committed, the things that you indicted him for, are some of the most heinous things imaginable. Rape, mass murder, humiliation, you know, cultural humiliation. I mean, why wouldn't the Serbian authorities immediately act with NATO and hand him over? Grab him and hand him over? I mean, it seems like we're suggesting that the entire nation uh, are genocidal. No, well, 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 certainly at that time, Serbia... Uh, was very uh, against the war crimes tribunal. They considered it an act of discrimination against Serbia. It was very unpopular with their government. They refused to recognize its legitimacy uh, and they weren't prepared to cooperate at all. In addition, Mladic was a sort of national hero. Uh, so, so it would have been very negative from, from a political point of view for them to do that. So it, it, it was for all of those reasons. Serbia certainly wasn't prepared to cooperate, and certainly when, when Milosevic was head of state, uh, he would have done everything to protect Mladic. Yep. Marcus, what do you think about that? Because you've been on the ground a lot in that part of the world, reporting Balkan well, well, politics. I, yeah, yeah. I, I'd just like to add that it isn't just Milosevic. I mean, his successor, who's Prime Minister now, Kostunica, is a nationalist, and we have to remember that. He's a Democrat. He's not a, a mass murderer. But he represents that mainstream opinion in Serbia, which is still very sympathetic, I think, to the aims that inspired people like Mladic. Not the murders, but nevertheless to the idea of... Uh, uh, an expanded Serbian state. I mean, these are nationalist people. They don't want to hand over what they see as their heroes. And they may be considering it now, but it's a very reluctant decision that they're making. It sounds like nationalism gone mad that you're describing, though. We're talking about a person, if he's guilty, guilty of mass murder. Yeah, but they don't accept that. Most people in Serbia simply don't accept that. Even if you go into a bar in Belgrade now, they'll tell you that the massacre in Srebrenica was a lie. It was invented by other people. Is that right? That, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm not saying everyone in Belgrade will say that, but you will find even in the capital, which is the most sophisticated place in Serbia, a lot of people will say that. Now, this absurd cat and mouse game has been going on um, with both uh, Mladic and uh, Karadic. And uh, are we any closer to a solution? We keep hearing arrest dates and rumours of all sorts of things. Now, well, there's, a, I, I, now there's a new deadline of yeah. April the 5th. I mean, what is going to happen? What do you think is happening right now? 
Uh, is that one for me? Yeah. Yeah, I think absolutely. that I, I think things are moving finally, especially now that Croatia, neighboring Croatia, has been forced to hand over its last major war crimes indictee, General Gotovina. And I think that has spurred Serbia on to the realization that there's actually no way out now. And the other factor is that more and more people in Serbia do want to join the European Union. Right. I think that is having an effect. They actually really do want to join it now, which they didn't when Judge Goldston in, indicted uh, Mladic ten years ago. That's, that's a big change in Serbia. And that is making people realize that they will have to pay a price. Right. They will have to hand these people over. Do you think his, his uh, arrest is, is imminent? I do, I do think it'll happen over the next month, yeah. Well, I'd be very surprised if uh, it gets to the crunch point in early April when Serbia's application for an, a, st a stability and association agreement with the EU comes up for its final stamp. And I think I'd be very surprised if Serbia hasn't handed Mladic over by then. They really will be courting trouble, which it seems... Uh, I don't think that will happen. Well, an EU, EU spokesman has been suggesting that uh, if they don't, they can kiss goodbye the whole idea of joining the yes, EU exactly. and the benefits that and, would come from that. And they have realised that. I think that is taken on board now, but it's taken like years for that to to get through. Yeah. Judge, that must anger you a lot. I mean, you indicted this, this man, obviously for, for good reasons in most of the world's eyes, and now we find that he will only be handed over for what sounds like politically pragmatic reasons rather than reasons of justice. Well, well, I think that, that, you know, I think one must accept that the whole, the whole endeavour of international justice uh, is a very political sort of thing. Um, they're, they're, they're moral reasons, they're the victims, but at the end of the day it's the political, it's political will and political motivations uh, that, that make the system work or, or, or cause its failure. What, what does that say though about, about the whole state of international law that a country can flaunt it? They can just thumb their nose, if you like, at your decision to indict this man, thumb their nose at the, uh, at the International no, War Crimes Tribunal, etc. Well, of course, in theory they can, but I think, I think the tide has changed. I think the United States is, certainly with regard to the International Criminal Court, uh, is taking a very uh, aberrational approach. All of, virtually all of the democracies, are there, are there any democracies of importance that are not on board with the International Criminal Court are really the United States, Japan and India. Uh, but you've got the whole of the European Union, you've got all of the, the democracies and the Commonwealth, you've got a hundred nations now fully supporting the International Criminal Court, uh, and that is a critical mass of countries, and it's certainly, I think, up to, up to the democracies uh, to, to point the way and to set the example. Uh, Marcus, the judge mentioned the US role in all of this. What, what of the, of the uh, stories coming out that the Americans have offered anything between 4 and 11 million euros to uh, Mladic's family and bodyguards, etc. Is there any truth in that suggestion? Well, I find it very implausible. I really do. I think it would rebound horribly on the United States if it was found that he had been offered all this money because, um, obviously, they would be seem like they were paying uh, one of the world's worst war, war criminals, um, a kind of huge slush fund for his defense. So I think it's slightly implausible. There's no doubt, however, I think that the Serbian government will be negotiating that money because they've done that in the past with other indictees. They have to, you, to promise to pay for their families and for top lawyers and all that stuff in order to get these guys to surrender voluntarily. So I don't doubt that there is someone negotiating money, but whether it's the United States is another question. In the meantime, um, arrest dates have uh, come and gone, handover dates have come and gone, and you're convinced though oh. that he, he will be handed, arrested and handed over by April 5? Well, convinced is probably slightly strong, but I think this is much more likely to be a real date because I think um, the Serbian government does want this treaty, this agreement with Europe. I think they really do want it, and they know that it's dead in the water um, in April if nothing's happened on the Mladic front. Judge, when, if that happens, if, as Marcus suggests, that he is uh, arrested and handed over on April 5th or before it, what then? How do we go about prosecuting your indictment? What happens to Vlad Mladic after that? Well, I think Mladic will, will appear in The Hague under the, under the rules of the uh, uh, tribunal. He will be handed all of the documents relevant to the case, uh, both inculpatory and if there are any exculpatory. He will obviously need time to prepare his defence. Uh, it could go two ways. He could follow the example 
uh, of, uh, of Milosevic uh, and refuse uh, counsel. I hope that the judges have learned from some of the mistakes I think they made in, in, in being too lenient with Milosevic. I would hate to see another repetition of a two-year period to prevent a prosecution case. There's a very strong case uh, ag uh, against Miladic, not only the evidence that, that was collected when I was there, but a lot of evidence has been collected since. I'm not privy to it, but I have no doubt following the, some of the evidence in the Milosevic trial, much of it uh, would be relevant to Miladic, and especially with regard to what, uh, what happened during the massacre of over 8,000 innocent men and boys at Srebrenica. Yeah, Milosevic, of course, has, has uh, played the court. It's been a long, drawn-out affair that's still inconclusive. I mean, is the same sort of thing going to happen with Miladic? Becomes a bit of a farce? Well, I certainly, I certainly hope not, and I don't expect so. As I say, I think, I think mistakes were made, and I've little doubt that the lessons will be learned. Thanks very much, Judge, and thanks very much, Marcus, for your time as well. Pleasure. And a sobering footnote to that discussion, this week the uh, International Red Cross emailed with the information that in Bosnia-Herzegovina alone, there are still an astonishing 15,000 people unaccounted for since the end of the Balkan conflict.